my talk is called Saving Sandfish, Conserving South Africa's Most Threatened Migratory Freshwater Fish. Our journey today begins out in the remote and ancient Durham River Valley. It's an extremely dry and hot place, very quiet, and it's about four or five hours drive from Cape Town. Here you can see the Ulifans During River system, which opens out onto the Atlantic Ocean on the West Coast. Um, in winter, the rivers in this area flow strongly, but in summer, they, they shrink back and many of them actually have no water at all in them in summer. The landscapes and riverscapes here really breathe with the seasons. And this has major implications for the wildlife that lives there, especially the aquatic wildlife. There is one species of fish whose life cycle is closely tied to this pulsing and breathing of nature, and that's the Clan William sandfish. It's one of the larger freshwater fish uh, in this part of the world. It's our only species that undertakes long spawning migrations, and its real unique feature is its downturned mouth. In Afrikaans, it's called an onderbek, and this is a peculiar adaptation to grazing algae and detritus uh, that collects on the surfaces of rocks. Uh, their grazing uh, feeding habits often leave behind these distinctive uh, feeding marks, and that's one way to tell if sandfish are in the area. Just like the rivers, the fish in this part of the world uh, are very ancient lineages, and anthropologists have found, uh, have found paintings of these fish with these peculiar downturned mouths on the walls of caves that the sand used to use on a seasonal basis. The sand generally painted their, the walls of their caves with symbols of things that were important to them, either spiritually or physically or nutritionally. And I believe they would certainly have taken advantage of this seasonal pulse of protein that would arrive uh, uh, at a very particular time of year as the sandfish migrate up these seasonal rivers, especially in spring. I think it would have been quite easy to imagine uh, the sand people going down and actually collecting fish from the, from the, from the shallow water where they might have been spawning. Um, and our conversations with people who have lived in this area for a long, long time, like Sara, a Frenchman who's lived at the junction of the During River and one of its tributaries, tells uh, tell stories about how um, maybe 50 years ago, sandfish were so abundant that she could go down to the river and collect them. And actually they would make them into fish cakes, which were apparently really delicious. Um, Willem, a farmer in another nearby river, also tells us about how abundant they once were. But these, today these fish have become increasingly scarce. Sara told us that in the 1990s, they became rare and she hasn't seen any for the last decade or two. Available scientific uh, data on sandfish population trends tell a similar story. Here we see a data set from one tributary in the Durin catchment that's been monitored by the DENC over the last decade or so, and it shows this clear pattern of serious decline, um, particularly driven by the, um, the fall off of young fish from the graph. This is a story that repeats itself across South Africa and indeed across the world. These mass declines in aquatic biodiversity in a relatively short space of time. Here, the Living Planet Index shows um, how Oh, since, 19, since a baseline of 1970, marine and terrestrial uh, uh, populations have declined by about 40% worldwide and how the story in freshwater is just so much more dramatic. The, the decline in freshwater populations that have been monitored for this index has been about double that. We've seen about an 84% decline in populations of monitored freshwater species over the last 50 years. Closer to home, South Africa, our national biodiversity assessment um, two years ago was really headlined by this, uh, this uh, statement that freshwater fishers have become our most threatened species group. 
And in particular, there's a very high proportion of endemic species in the country, particularly in the Western Cape province as well, and a very high proportion of these endemics under threat. What's driving this high level of threat? Well, it's really a cocktail of, of different factors, often interacting factors. Invasive species have had very strong impacts on a lot of freshwater fish populations. Um, climate change, the warming of rivers, the changes of flow regimes, and habitat degradation, whether that's impacts on water quality or water quantity or both. Often the, the, the declines or changes in fish populations have happened out of sight, beneath the surface of our rivers and wetlands. Um, but when you actually start to have a closer look, um, it's become apparent to me anyway that there's some really special species living in these rivers, some real characters and charismatic freshwater fish. This is a conservation biology master student from Kenya snorkeling in a South African river for his first time, surrounded by a school of redfin minnows. More closely, you can see the redfins get their name because their fins light up to try and uh, impress females during spawning season. Cape Kerpers, although only about 15 or 20 centimeters big, really have the personality of a much bigger fish. These are ambush predators, cryptically colored, big eyes, big mouths, very effective at feeding on small fish and invertebrates. In the petite Galaxias, with its beautiful facial markings, we thought this was just one species in South Africa. The genetics are showing us that it may be as many as 10 or even more, a cryptic species complex right under our noses. Bigger charismatic species like the Clan William Sawfin, popular among fly fishermen. And of course, our focus today, the Clan William sandfish, which can grow up to over half a meter in length. So coming back to the sandfish, their home is the Ulifan Stirring River system on the West Coast. They would have once been widespread in this system, but in our lifetime, they have seem to have disappeared completely from the Ulifan's uh, half of the catchment. And Populations now remain, remain very, in a very patchy distribution in the Durham River main stem, and they seem to only be able to still spawn in, in, a, in a very small number of tributaries that flow into the Durham River. One of those is the Beedo, and we're going to have a closer look at what happens, what we think is happening in the Beedo River at this point in time. So the Beedo is a seasonal tributary. Um, it flows into the During. The During has water all year round, um, sometimes just standing pools, but that's really where the sandfish spend most of their year. Um, after the winter rains, the tributaries like the Beedo start to flow, and that water triggers a migration of adult sandfish up into, up into the tributary. They'll migrate 5, 10, maybe 15 kilometers up to their spawning grounds, and they'll wait for just the right flow, just the right temperature, to lay their eggs. And then those adults get out of there pretty quickly. They don't want to get trapped. But then the eggs hatch, the larvae swim out of those eggs, grow into juveniles, and these young sandfish feed and grow and move back down towards the During River where they would then contribute to the greater population and inject a new cohort of young fish. Well, that's how things used to work anyway, because today, Unfortunately, the sandfish aren't really making it past juvenile. Uh, there's a almost complete recruitment failure every year. The small fish aren't making it through. And some of the main reasons behind that is basically just uh, a lack of water. These fish are running out of water in summer, um, getting, getting stranded in very small pools, very warm pools, and unfortunately getting stranded alongside alien fish that have, been, that have been introduced into the During and invaded up a lot of these tributaries. Um, predatory alien fish like bluegills or bass. Here you can see a 22 centimeter bluegill that had a, that had a five centimeter sandfish in its stomach, very effective predator. Um, and as a result, the, um, there's the little sandfish. Uh, well, what once was a sandfish. And as a result, the recruitment um, is almost zero at this point in time. And as a consequence of that, we're seeing very few young fish uh, turning up in the During. 
And we're left with this aging population of older sandfish that seems to be slowly declining to the point where our surveys in 2013 uh, uh, revealed a catch of just 50 fish. And that's over setting nets for an entire week along the Durham River. So that really sets the backdrop for this conservation work in the Saving Sandfish project. And our plan with the project is really quite simple. It's to rescue young fish from these dangerous riverine habitats and uh, to relocate them to safer habitats where they will have a better chance of surviving their first year of life and growing to a size that's big enough to avoid predation by alien fish. The first step is to find the fish um, after the adults have spawned, to find those little young fish, to catch them, of course, to admire them, to, to carry them in buckets with aerated water, ice blocks, drive them up um, into, and then release them into safer habitats. Last year, we, we took them right up 25 kilometers upstream into the upper Bido River, a place, uh, a section of river that has water all year round, that's uh, where a little waterfall keeps alien fish out and essentially a, a safer place for these little sandfish to grow. But 900 meters is a very, a very short stretch of river <laughs> to be the stronghold for a species. So having lost most of their safe habitat in the wild, we had to come up with a plan to create new refugia for these little sandfish. And so we started talking to landowners, farmers, often over a glass of wine. And we found out that a lot of them never even knew about the sandfish. They, didn't, they weren't even aware of these beautiful, powerful fish that were migrating um, seasonally through the rivers um, on their farms. And that's probably a good place to introduce the storytelling or communication dimension of this project. It's really a hybrid between science and conservation and storytelling. And we're using this visual storytelling approach, which is really just any form of visual media to narrow the gap between people living in the catchment and the freshwater life um, that's, uh, uh, that occurs beneath the surface of the rivers. Um, here you can see a 360 camera revealing the seasonal difference of a, on a part of the Bido River, very striking. And we're using a blend of different visual storytelling approaches, virtual reality experience with headsets that we're going to share with landowners, uh, a web series that can, anybody is free to watch on YouTube to reach out to a wider audience, and ultimately a documentary film to really try to tell the story of the, of the sandfish in its uh, greatest possible way. And we've started, uh, as soon as we've started showing, using these visual media to better communicate the amazing freshwater life beneath the surface with some of the landowners in the valley, we've seen some really interesting um, enthusiasm. Some of these landowners have showed a real interest to get involved to the point where they have offered to use their farm dams to create sanctuaries for the sandfish to grow safely in. Farm dams with invasive fish. So in some cases, the landowners have drained the dams and refilled them to make sure they are safe for the little sandfish. In other cases, we've used a piscicide to remove alien fish and the, and the landowners have gotten involved in removing the fish and collecting the data. And really here, the big picture is to find a way to bridge this gap, to bridge the, the break in the life cycle, to, to move those little young sandfish into safe refugia, give them a chance to grow and mature, and then to release them back in the wild when they're big enough to fend for themselves. So to, to finish things off, how do we sort of, what can we learn from this? What are the take home messages? How could we roll this out to, to, other, to other places? Well, at this point in the project, two things really stand out for me. The first is the importance of spending time in the catchment, building a good understanding, not only of the biology of the species and the ecosystem, but also of the people and their relationship with the river, the people that essentially live in that valley and are the closest to the freshwater. And secondly, that the importance of, si of how science needs to be accompanied by some form of visual storytelling or other form of creative communication to narrow the gap between um, ourselves and uh, freshwater ecosystems. 
So if you're interested in finding out more about the project, you can uh, visit fishwaterfilms.com or on Instagram. You can type Saving Sandfish into YouTube to uh, check out the series. And lastly, I'd just like to thank uh, our, uh, our funders and uh, partners on the project, of which, which there are many. And that's one of the beauties of this project is this really, really cool, diverse collaboration. And yeah, any questions, uh, which I guess comes in the form of a Q&A. <laughs> thank you very much.